and welcome to Research and Justice for All, a podcast series from Health Affairs sponsored by CVS Health. I'm your co-host, Dr. Jonay Caldoun, Chief Health Equity Officer at CVS Health. And I'm co-host, Dr. Shri Chagaturu, Chief Medical Officer at CVS Health. Shri, we've had such a great time uh, with all of our guests who have come on the show. I can't believe this is our last interview in our podcast series. I know. We've had amazing guests on the show who've shared some really great insights and how we can help to advance health equity across multiple sectors in our healthcare system. Each one of them comes from different organization with different levers, and it's been just wonderful to hear how they individually and collectively are addressing this important issue in our healthcare system. That's right. It's also just so exciting to see so many institutions and organizations excited about health equity and making very specific and tangible uh, actions to actually address disparities in health inequities. We've gained some really great insights. And I'm really excited about today's final episode. We're speaking with Rashad Burgess, the Vice President of Advancing Health and Black Equity at Gilead Sciences. So we're going to be discussing with him how they think about advancing health equity and how private sector companies in particular can advance health equity goals. You know, I really loved our conversation, how he talked about this this point about uh, being global and local at the same time and how, how you work with local communities to advance public health. I agree, Janae. It was a really great conversation where we learned a lot about his personal passions and interests into how he got into this work. What does Gilead do in advancing health equity He talked about a specific initiative, Compass Initiative, which is working to address the HIV AIDS epidemic in southern United States and gave an amazing number of examples of the pillars and the specific work on addressing health equity uh, when it comes to HIV AIDS epidemic in southern United States. And then, as you talked about, all of the work that they're doing internationally and improving uh, health equity. So it's just a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. So let's get to it. Here's our interview with Rashad Burgess. Welcome, Rashad, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Research and Justice for All podcast. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, Shri and I are really looking forward to our conversation today. We're going to be talking about how the private sector can work to address really important public health and health equity challenges. So let's jump right in. And so the first question like we like to ask all of our guests is, why is this work of health equity important to you? Thank you for, again, thank you for having me. Um, this this work of health equity is has always been important to me and really I see uh, on a personal perspective has been a part of my life life mission. Um, I grew up on the South Side and South Suburbs of Chicago, and the in, in the nineties I saw the impact that HIV was having on Black and Brown communities all around me. Um, I lost so many friends. I saw so many friends really struggling with um the illness of of HIV and those are oftentimes referred to some of the some of the dark days that was before we had the therapies that we have today um and so i saw those inequities and i saw people who were you know really struggling and oftentimes didn't survive and so that caused me to really think about what how a disease and how an infection is impacting our communities and my communities and so to make a long story really short is that I had a very dear friend of mine who um, lost his battle to to AIDS um, and he took his last breath on the couch of his mother. In his final days, what was starkly true was that so much of the reason that he lost his battle was not just the virus itself, but it was the struggles around accessing care. It was the struggles around the stigma and the shame that accompanied the virus and all the whispering that happened and how that not only impacted his decisions he made around accessing care, but also how he actually lived some of his some of his last days. And so um, it was that moment I said, we have to do something. And so I began work around addressing HIV AIDS in the black church and in black communities. And that's what 
got me to where we are today. And there's a lot in between uh, those days in the 90s and where I'm at today. But that's what started my commitment. And every role I've had in some form or fashion, I've really approached it from a lens of health equity and being very mindful of oftentimes the people who don't have the voice at the table. Um, And so I always say when I show up at the table, I show up with thousands of people at the table that the others sitting there may not physically see, but that's who's in my mind I'm thinking about as we are making many of the decisions and having the conversations we're having. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. that that's so powerful. And, and and thank you for all the work that you've done for, for decades, really, in this really important space. Um, and, and as you noted, you know, we're in a different place now, but there's still challenges with access and, and stigma and, and access to treatment. So I know we'll get into that uh, in our conversation. Um, so tell us a little bit about Gilead. You work at a biopharmaceutical company. Tell us more about Gilead, the scope and breadth of the company, and, and also kind of how Gilead thinks about uh, public health and health equity. So Gilead, one of the things that we we do is we develop medicines to prevent and treat life-threatening diseases, um, including HIV, viral hepatitis, cancer. And over the past 30 years, three decades, our passion for making the world a healthier place has really led us to a cure for hepatitis C. And also it's really transformed our work in HIV prevention. As you know, that we were the first to market with PrEP, uh, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis for the prevention of acquiring HIV. You know, we're also a global company. um, So we operate in 35 countries with more than 17,000 employees. And so we really do have a breadth of work. And in that 35 years that we've been in this business, we've really seen that It's not only about the innovation of our medicine and our therapies. That's key. That's core to who we are. But it's also about ensuring that everyone has access and that communities that are disproportionately impacted have access. And so we have a long history of working with communities that are disproportionately impacted by HIV, by hepatitis, by cancer, and really working with those communities to ensure that they have access. You know, one of the things that inspired me about Gilead um, and why I left the, the public sector to join Gilead was actually really our ultimate goal of around creating a healthier world um, in which really everyone has access to achieving their ultimate and their best health. And I think that that's something that every day we're making progress towards. It's a it's a lot of work uh, in that, but we are making incredible progress. And so we get it from the business side, obviously our innovation, our therapies, but we understand to take advantage of those therapies and of that innovation, we have to ensure access. And so we have an enormous commitment to health equity um, because what good is it to innovate if people don't have access to the therapies, right? Rashad, thank you so much for sharing uh, both your own personal history as well as telling us a lot about Gilead and its mission. And as we were looking at all the great work that Gilead is doing, one initiative that came out was the Compass Initiative. And I was wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about what is the Compass Initiative and how did you arrive at that initiative and what's been the progress? Absolutely. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Compass. I think it's also just important to um, just set a little context around, around Compass. So, so Compass is a 10-year, $100 million commitment that we've made to addressing HIV in the South. And we are actually approaching the fifth year anniversary um, of, that, of that commitment and really excited about the work that has happened and also the work that will be happening. Um, but I think it's important to understand just some of the context. So we know that in the South, the South represents about 38% of the U.S. population, but over 52% of all new HIV cases happen in the South. When we talk about sort of racial ethnic um, inequities that exist in terms of who's disproportionately impacted by HIV, We know that African-Americans make up 13 to 14 percent of the U.S. population, yet represent 42 percent of new HIV diagnoses. Latinos make up about 19 percent of the U.S. population 
and about 27% of new HIV diagnosis. And you know, I think it's important. We have to acknowledge the impact that HIV has on the LGBTQ community because that's really, really key in our efforts in Compass. And I'll, 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 I'll come back to some of the details of Compass, but two-thirds of all new HIV infections in 2019 were among gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. A disproportionate amount of those, and the predominantly, were black and Latino. The majority of those infections were amongst black and Latino. So just setting the table, if you will, of why it is that we focus so much on the South, it's because that's where the epidemic is at. That's where it's been at for some time. But it's also, when we look at the the epidemic as of today and new infections, that is where it is at. So to talk a little bit about the work of Compass and specifically the work that we're doing, uh, this work is really transformative in that we actually, as I said, this is a 10-year commitment. We're in the fifth year of that 10-year commitment um, of $100 million. We have served over 315,000 people. We work with over 390 organizations throughout the South. And this work really centers around addressing stigma. So really promoting ideas and ways in which people can rethink and reframe HIV. Also looking at advocacy and the important work of advocates, um, as well as education. Because oftentimes us who are doing this work every day, we're highly informed, but we know that it's important to have um, health literacy work um, that actually is accompanying our overall body of work. Because every day, there are people existing in communities who are still needing to learn about HIV and their vulnerability to HIV. And so that is a framework. That's a big chunk of the work we do. Um, and we're really excited about the programming of, of Compass. It truly is one of our signature initiatives. Rashad, that's really helpful to hear about the three components of the Compass Initiative, stigma, advocacy, education. And how does that, working on those, address health equity when it comes to HIV prevention and treatment? So if you could bring it to life, some of the work that Compass is doing in these areas. Great question. There's also one additional pillar I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't state, and that is the pillar around faith. Because we understand that working in Black communities in the South you have to make sure that you have a component that's building the capacity of an education of faith leaders. And so that's that's really key. And so what we're doing is we're really laying a framework and doing work every day that helps address the inequities that we see across the across the state, whether that's building up advocates that can advocate for legislation at the state level or even at the federal level that helps move forward policies that benefit black and brown communities in the South or LGBTQ communities that are in the South or working with systems of care and working around innovation and how it is that these systems of care can actually innovate so that we can actually ensure that no one is lost in care. Um, And so there's a lot of very specific projects that are done by those 390 plus organizations, but they really are tailored to the local needs of that organization, of those communities. And that's really key, is that we recognize that there's not a one size that fits all that's going to work. So, you know, the work in Mississippi is very different than the work in Florida, or the work specifically in Orlando is different than the work in Atlanta or Charlotte, because those areas are different and the needs of those areas are different and the community infrastructure in those areas are different. What's the commonality is that they're all disproportionately impacted by HIV. But what we also understand is those social determinants of health that underline the drivers of those infections. That is what we're working on um, as part of this work as well. I want to chime in on something that you said earlier when you talked about the history of Gilead and particularly PrEP. Can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, the challenges with access or uptake, if you will, with with PrEP and how the Compass uh, Initiative may be working in communities to address that challenge? Absolutely. One of the things that we've we recognized and we recognized early on was that there was differential uptake in in PrEP. Um, and we saw certain communities, um, oftentimes um, re- well-resourced communities, you know, the uptake was PrEP was pretty early. 
pretty fast and pretty deliberate. Um, and we've seen a direct correlation with reduction in new infections. So if you're a data wonk and you're sitting here watching, tracking surveillance, you look at cities like San Francisco, who are, they're putting out data that they now are under 200 infections a year, um, which is a really big deal because at the, back in the 80s, that was an epicenter. If you think about, if you reflect back, I mean, that was a place that had thousands of infections a year. And so what we have seen is that the uptake and prep amongst black, brown communities has not been as strong. And it's not, and we said, we see that differential today. And so what we have done very specifically is empower communities and support communities and doing education that resonates with their communities doing advocacy that can break down some of these barriers. Some of the barriers is that some of these states haven't expanded Medicaid. So you have some of the individuals who are most vulnerable for HIV acquisition aren't able to access care until they actually get HIV. I mean, just think about that. Do you think that enough providers are aware of PrEP and are are getting it out? Talk to us a little bit about the provider clinical community. We have a field force that does education every, every day on our therapies um, that's not connected in any way to our giving work or to Compass. But what you see, and what if I, if I can speak as an enterprise-wide level, so not specifically about Compass, but we see that there are, there are gaps in provider education um, in certain communities. There's also the dynamic of provider bias in certain communities that are more, that resonates more with others. And so that is why educating providers is really important, but it's also why educating patients is really important because we have data that when patients walk into the door and ask for medication, they're much more likely to acquire it. Um, And so it helps to mitigate or impact the reliance on the provider initiating that discussion, which gets in some ways to the last point is that, um, everyone's not comfortable having a sexual health conversation. And so when we've done work to look at what are some clinical markers, you know, a, a STI infection, for example, that can be a proxy for someone's vulnerability to acquiring HIV. And that's a bit important because while we've done work and there's important work happening to get providers um, to be more robust in conversations around sexual health, there are some places where that's just not going to happen. And so you have to have other markers. You have to have other what we call clinical cues that a clinician can see that is going to say, hey, you're vulnerable for acquiring HIV. Let's actually have this conversation about PrEP and it not be centered on, on risk, if you will, of, of acquiring HIV or one's vulnerability. I also think that it's important to acknowledge that that is very imperfect. And when you talk to people who are living with HIV, what you oftentimes discover is that they didn't see themselves as being vulnerable for acquiring HIV. And so you can't always go by one's perceived notions of vulnerability, whether that is the provider's notion of vulnerability or whether it's even the patient's vulnerability, because it matters where you live. If you have a background prevalence, a high background prevalence that increases one's vulnerability, it matters one's uh, access to care. Like there's so many vulnerabilities that one can have that's not connected to risk-taking sexual behavior. And I put that in quotations because people won't see me, but it's, it's, it's just something to sort of distinguish and to differentiate um, from one's vulnerabilities specifically around, around sex. And Rashad, as you were talking through um, going back to Compass, you brought up something that we haven't heard too much in our series of conversations to date which is the role of faith and how faith can address health equity uh, when we bring those together. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about why is that one of the four pillars and how is that uh, by engaging faith leaders, how have you been able to address some of these issues around uh, uh, HIV stigma and access to care? You know, supporting, you know, faith-based education and faith-based advocacy has really been, really been key. And it's 
Uh, there's some really phenomenal work that's been done by our coordinating center. So each of the pillars are uh, coordinated by a coordinating center. And this is really, it's really key because it, and, and these are academic partners. So for faith, it's uh, Wake Forest University um, and their, their seminary. And so they're doing work of educating pastors. And so it's educating pastors on the everything from the fundamentals of HIV, incorporating um, HIV and inclusive theology and their messaging it's, it's really key because some of the work um, is not just about, you know, educating HIV as it relates to an, a disease or an infection. It is also the work of, of how to ensure that our messaging isn't driving stigma, how it is to make sure that our messaging actually is driving support, setting up HIV ministries, and also how to also make sure that pastors are showing up at the tables and the tables of advocacy, for example, to really ensure that they are also being brought along the journey of HIV, because that's really, that's really key. So these pillars of compass around, you know, helping organizations become sustainable, you know, reducing stigma, addressing mental health and well-being, and supporting faith-based advocacy, these are really, really key in how we actually drive and address HIV in the South. And Rashad, as you've talked about all of this uh, wonderful and important work, you've had to go through a process of selecting your partners. You talked about your partnership with Wake Forest. You talked about your partnership with faith-based institutions and selecting individual pastors. You talked about identifying individuals who would be good advocates for uh, state um, advocacy or local advocacy. Many of our listeners are doing similar type of having to select their partners to do this important hard work. So I'm wondering if you could just talk through what is your process for identifying partners as you advance this work on health equity? We are a biotech pharma company, uh, a, a science company, so we definitely take a data-driven approach to direct resources where the need is the most. And so that's core. It, it actually, you know, from a Coming from my public health background, it actually you, you go where the disease is, you go where the need is the most. And it's really it's really key. Um, and so we look at our how we select for our partnerships and how we are working with community organizations or how we're looking in other areas of the business. It's where's the where's the need the most. And so for the partners, we are thinking about, you know, where they're located. Are they located in communities that are most vulnerable? Do they have the skill set and do they have the ability to impact those communities? Because that's the other thing is that we want to see this work having an impact, which is really it's really important. Um, it's, it's, that's how we see we, we see the change. And so the other piece is around the capacity as that really ensuring that organizations have the capacity, have the capability. So, yes, they have the skills, but they also have have the capacity because that work, this work is so important that you have to have organizations that have the capacity. And so we have processes internally to help ensure that we are pulling in those factors as we are making those sorts of selection decisions. If I can just say one other thing that I think is important, um, because it is, it gets, it's where the need is that, I think there's also one other piece is that where there's some unmet needs. And, and so just when you were thinking about from a health equity perspective, you do have to think about where, what communities and what organizations, what places have not traditionally been supported but need to be supported that can have an impact. That also is, is, a, is an additional factor that I think is important to call out. So I, I love how you're talking about being very, very local and working with local organizations and, and advocates in that capacity. So Gilead's also doing work globally to help end the HIV epidemic. So talk to us a little bit about that initiative. And how do you think about the work globally? Is it, is it different or, or similar to the work that you're doing in the United States that's a great question. And I think what's important to acknowledge is that there's no one size that fits all approach, especially when you're talking about um, 
global work. And I would actually make that argument. And even if you're looking at even even just within the U.S., is that you have to be mindful of of communities. You have to be mindful of where those communities sit and the dynamics of those communities. And so uh, there's a phrase that's called global. Um, so we take a global approach. That's from global to local approach, where we start from a global framework and tailor solutions to meet the specific needs and nuances, and the nuances of countries, regions, populations, all the way down to their neighborhood. It's a big ask, but that's why it's critical that we have boots on the ground. And so, you know, when I talk about we do work in over 35 countries, we have teams of people in those countries who are very connected to these communities. And in the context of HIV and even in the other therapeutic areas we work in, that are connected to those communities that are disproportionately impacted so that we are making sure that we have this global framework and our work in and execution of that framework, we actually are adapting as necessary. So, so thank you for that. You know, I want to go back to something you said earlier around the importance of, of, of policy. And so you noted, you know, the expansion of Medicaid is an important policy to advance uh, access to, to testing and, and treatment. Can you talk about maybe, you know, you, you talked about the 90s and how we've come a, a long way since the 90s. What are some of those key policies you think helped us get to where we are and the successes? And what are some of the policies that you think uh, need to be improved or changed uh, to be able to advance HIV testing and treatment and prevention? I think, you know, it, it can't be overstated the importance of the Ryan White Care Act and how that act has in the U.S. really was transformative uh, policy work and a transformative policy for people living with HIV. I mean, it really ensured that people who were living with HIV have access to care ir irrespective of income. I mean, it really played a very, very important role in making sure that people with HIV had medications. Rashad, for our listeners, uh, could you just tell them a little bit about what's in the Ryan White Act uh, to bring them up to speed? The Ryan White Act is a is the act that is a, essentially a payer of uh, of last resort for HIV care services, uh, both you know clinical services, so you know HIV medical care, but it also has a set of wraparound services that are really essential and, and, and important. So case managers, for example, that can really help people navigate not only their health care, but also their lives so that they can stay in health care. So if someone is having housing issues, they have someone who is able to advocate for them and work with them to ensure housing. And we know housing is a social determinant of health that is really impactful on someone's access to care and their, them staying on care. Um, so that policy has been really key. And especially since we have learned there's the importance of someone being virally suppressed, having such low levels of virus in their body, that not only does it have a benefit for them, because it means just as a, as a person living with HIV, um, you're, the, there's minimal viral shedding, HIV viral shedding happening in your body. But what's also important is that you're not able to transmit the virus to someone else. So when you're thinking about it at a community level and a public health level, it really is important to ensure that people who are living with HIV are aware of their status, are connected to care, are on therapies, and are virally suppressed. And that is, that is really core to, to the work. Um, and the Ryan White Care Act has helped us um, ensure that that happens. Another area of policy that is really key is the routinization of HIV screening uh, in clinical care settings. And so that is something where, you know, as we've really seen that, especially as we have, we're 40 years into the HIV epidemic, that people being aware of their status is really key to, um, again, preventing new HIV infections, but also people having healthy outcomes, if you will, you know, living long term with the virus, you know, not having opportunistic infections, etc. And so we've seen where, you know, when you do um, testing that's just based on vulnerability or risk, people don't perceive themselves as being vulnerable to HIV. People don't see themselves being at risk for HIV. But when you have an 
opt-out scenario of testing or you're routinizing HIV testing in clinical settings, it allows you to catch people who are HIV positive and unaware of their status and don't recognize their vulnerability for HIV. Um, And so it's really been an important tool at identifying acute infections, so people who are, you know, newly infected, but also identifying people who've been living with HIV for years and didn't know it. And so those are two really key, key uh, areas um, that are really important and really have been transformative to our work. Well, thank you so much for that. And I absolutely agree. The Ryan Wright Act has had such a transformative uh, impact on HIV and AIDS in our in our country. And, and also, you know, as an ER doctor, seeing the routine testing and screening for HIV in our, in our emergency departments has been really great to see as well. Uh, so thank you so much. This has just been an enlightening uh, conversation. We really appreciate all the work that you and Gilead are doing and will continue to do, not just in the United States, but across the globe, really when it comes to uh, HIV and AIDS. So thank you so much for joining us on our podcast today. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure to chat with both of you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashad. You know, what an insightful discussion. Rashad really gave us great examples of approaches that Gilead's using to really advance health equity in addressing the HIV and AIDS epidemic. You know, I, I really like how he talked about this issue of awareness and vulnerability uh, for both patients, people, but also providers. And I also like how he really talked about some of the important policies and the importance of the Ryan White Act, for example, in really uh, expanding access and helping us get some real successes uh, when it comes to HIV testing, treatment, and of course, prevention. So what a great conversation with Rashad today. I was struck by his personal passion. That story that he shared was incredibly powerful and how he's committed his entire life to this important work. But then he also talked about the specific data about how HIV continues to affect communities in America and how it's important for us to be very targeted in how we think about our partners and work with them deeply uh, to address this work. And I think, you know, the conversation on the role of faith and how faith plays a role in health equity, uh, addressing stigma, advocacy, and education, those four pillars of the Compass Initiative, I think, are incredibly powerful. Absolutely. And I also learned a new word, glocal, right? How do you think both locally and globally when it comes to advancing public health? So I love that. Well, Shree, that that's a wrap. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on the Research and Justice for All podcast sponsored by CBS Health. While this was the last episode in our series, please do check out our other episodes if you haven't already. And also share this podcast with anyone you know who's working to advance health equity or, or wants to know how to do it and do it well. Shree, it's, it's certainly been a pleasure co-hosting this series with you. I think we had a lot of fun. I think so too, Janae. It's been great. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed these conversations as much as we have. Take care, everyone. Research and Justice for All is produced by Health Affairs. This season is sponsored by CVS Health. If you enjoyed this episode, the best thing you could do is share it with a friend or a colleague. It helps people find the show. Thanks for listening, and be sure to check out Health Affairs' other podcasts, The Health Policy and Health Affairs This Week. Health Affairs, where health policy advances.